Greetings, I am Maleficius, and I'm back with more of Shenzhen I.O. Well, last time, I managed to get a good chunk of engineering and programming done, although I got a little hung up on the IR sensor. But, I've actually figured it out. Oh, yes, one other thing. Data sheets. Uh, well, okay. Actually turned out pretty good size there. Uh... Yeah, I wanted to show the actual... well, now it's not. Yeah, here's the documentation on the DT2415 incremental clock chip. So, yeah, this is what I was looking at. And what I could look at right now, considering I'm going to be going back to that shortly. And here's the blurb down at the bottom. Anyway... But yeah, I've come up with a solution to this, and it took me, uh, say, an hour out of game and an hour in game to hammer out the code correctly. But yeah, let's get into it. And yeah, uh, I may have rearranged the design a bit. And one more thing to take note of, the chips added in the design. You can move them around just like microprocessors. Or microcontrollers, rather. Oh, wait, this one? Wait. Hmm. Okay, well. Wait, no. Okay, there. There. And there. But I'm leaving them here because this is how I set up. So, anyway, the big catch is that you have to be able to handle it when it's in. See, there's two possibilities with this scenario. The on time can be greater than the off time, or the off time can be greater than the on time, and your solution has to be able to handle both scenarios. So anyway, here's how my coding works. This MC6000 handles the the whether or not it's on or off. So first thing is, I test whether X1, the on time, is greater than X2, the off time. And now, if that is the case, We've got a new command here, JMP more. So JMP is jump, and basically it means advance to the label in the code. So, what does that mean? Well, it means that if the on time is greater than the off time, we jump ahead to the label more. But let's say that the on time is actually less than the off time. So the code falls through here to this test less than p1 x1. So if the current time, the p1 from the RTC chip, is less than the on time, then I jump to off. And if it's not, or rather if it's equal to or greater than the on time, which is, yeah, when the current time equals the on time, the device should be armed. And when the current time equals the off time, the device should be disarmed. So, we jump to less. So, in either case, we've jumped to either to the le checking the less or to the off condition. Now, if it was actually the case that the on time was greater than the off time, it jumps up to here. We test, test less than... Yeah, we test if the current time is less than the, the uh, on time. And so if it's equal to or greater than the on time, meaning it's on, we jump to the on condition. And if it is less than the on time, then it falls through to the less condition. In this case, we're testing if 
the current time is less than the off time. If it is not, if it is equal to or greater than the off time, we jump to the off condition. But if it is less than the off time, we jump to the on condition. And so finally, we made it to on. Although I probably could have eliminated this one line here, but I just wanted to be sure. So, on. Move P0 to X3. This moves the value from the sensor into this other microcontroller, which handles the sensor part. And if it is on, then I have it jump to the end, because the next line of code is the off condition, in which case I move a value of 0 to the X3 port and into this microcontroller. And after the off uh, is the end condition, in which case it sleeps 1, so that it can go through the whole cycle over and over again. It's not a very elegant solution, but if you've watched Scott Manley's video, his solution to this puzzle will look a lot different. It's because they change how this puzzle tests. So anyway, here's the handling for the sensing part. Basically, SLX X0, so it sleeps until it receives data from the X bus port. We then move the value into the accelerator because we can't modify we can't modify anything while it's being sent in. Then we test if the uh, not the accelerator the accumulator. We test if the accumulator is greater than 19. Basically, if it's yeah down here when the device is armed and the sensor reads at or above a value of 20, the alarm out should put you in the active. So if it is if it is 20 or more, we move a value of 100 to P out of P1 into the alarm, and if it's not, we move a value of 0 out to switch off the alarm. And of course, you can't move the sen the uh, simple in these simple inputs that are not for chips. So anyway, verification. So if you just if we just advance, it looks like it works pretty well. Oh, we're using it uses a massive amount of power. And now this is the part where if you just coded for the first situation where the on time is greater than the off time, this will trip you up because now the on time is less than the off time. However, the revised code handles this situation as well. Test run 2 of 80. Okay, well, now reset and run the simulation. So it looks like we're going to have to run 80 test runs. And, but I think this should work. As long as the on time does not equal the off time, which is a situation that I don't think should happen. Okay. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, we hit the most common cost. Well, I did. And used a lot more power than most people did. And I used a lot more code than most people did. But as I said, as I said it's not an elegant solution, but it was what I was able to come up with. All right. Just letting you know that your design for the infrared sensor component was well received by our partners and is set to be integrated into a number of products currently under development by various defense and security firms. Obviously, our performance here opens the door to more jobs of this nature, so thank you for contributing to Long Teng's future. Li Li Wu. And from Carl Teske, hang on, we're becoming a defense supplier? Yeah, that might be a little worrying. And for this, I'll just have a sip of water. Mm. Tasty, tasty water. And working remotely from Wu Li Li. Note that I will be working remotely today and maybe tomorrow, just in case you are looking for me in the office. From Joe. That's weird. I thought you got back from your trip yesterday. Aha! I did. I've been stuck in a traffic jam on the way back from the airport since then. You've been stuck in the same traffic jam for over 24 hours? When a city grows as fast as Shenzhen has, it's natural to expect there might be some strain. I'm fine. I have food and water in here. Maybe next time a virtual meeting is better. Gee. Oh yes, and I wish to apologize to the city of Shenzhen, which does in fact exist. Yeah, it's actually... It is northwest of Hong Kong, as I thought. It's actually built on the... 
It's built in the land that connects Hong Kong to mainland China. And it apparently is a pretty big electronics manufacturer. So, I just don't think it's a megapolis yet. So on to the next project, a virtual reality buzzer. From David P. Solomon, who we've not heard from in a while. Hi all, apologies for the personal side here, but I've met this wonderful girl named Xiao Mei, and well, to make a long story short, she's set to move in with me next month. There's just one small issue, and it's something I thought maybe we could create a product to help with. See, when I'm doing my VR sessions, it's easy for someone to sneak up on me because I can't see or hear them. Awkward to say the least. This inspired me to think of a product. A simple vibrating buzzer that attaches to a VR headset so it can be felt even during the most intense sequences. Connecting that to a radio controller, I could place the button outside my study and Xiao Mei could buzz me when she needs me. No chance of me being caught by surprise. What do you think? I'm sure plenty of other VR enthusiasts might find themselves in a similar predicament, and this is a solution inexpensive enough to be an impulse buy. Congrats, David! Note about the radio chip you will be using. Normally, reading XBus causes the microcontroller to block until data becomes available. However, the, this radio has a non-blocking XBus buffer. Non-blocking buffer will immediately return a value of negative 999 when no data is currently available. Should make it easier. Ah. <sighs> Well, I really do not remember how Scott and Manley designed this thing. I think it's been, what, a month since I watched that? So, I'm going in very blind now. Alright, so we've got this, yeah. Radio RX is a non-blocking XBus input connected to a radio receiver. And buzzer is a simple output connected to an electromechanical buzzer. When a data packet is received over the radio, Read it and execute the corresponding command in the following table. 0, power off, turn off the buzzer. 1, power on, turn on the buzzer. Now let's see. I might be able to... Yeah, this might work for a touch simple output. Well... Hmm. I wonder. Well, let's take a look at that verification. Okay, so... Radio RX sends okay so by default it's sending a value of negative 999 and then here it sets sends sending a value of 1 at which point i need to make a simple pulse and then it's returning a 99 negative 999 here and then a zero all right so let's think about this so start by hooking up and okay test less than uh, we want to test if x0 is less than 0 and I think if that's the case jump end then I'll create an end label and say sleep 1 Great. Now then. Um, hmm. Okay, so if the stage is at 1, we want it to... Let's see. Or maybe... What if I do a TC... A compare exam? A uh, command. Okay, TCP... So, okay. TCP is test compare. So we're comparing two data values, and this is in the language reference. Oh, and I'm curious: is this is this a radio chip in the documentation? It might be. Um, I'm not seeing it right now, but okay, never mind. I'll just go through the code. Okay, so TCP. Yeah. So this is like this combines this kind of combines all of the the test equal, test greater than, and test less than into one command, sort of. So, we're compa comparing the first value of the first operand to the value of the second operand. In this case, we want to compare x0 with 0. Now that, that changes the code around, because if a is greater than b, then the positive instruction is enabled and the negative instruction is disabled, 
and if A is less than B, then the negative is disabled, and the, or rather, the positive is disabled, the negative is enabled. But if A is exactly equal to B, it will fall through. So, first, if it's less than zero, then it's outputting a negative 999, and I want it to jump to the end. Then if it's positive, that means it's a state, in a state one, uh, which means I need to be generating a pulse.